sort of the third stool of the dynamic trio, Mr. Elliot Conley. <laughs> All right, so uh, the great thing, of the, the reason I think this is the uh, most fun presentation I give every year is because we got three guys and we don't always agree. And that's, that's <laughs> terrific, so you get, this, get some perspective on this. All right, so how do things look? Well, I actually think they look pretty good. Uh, uh, when you get down to it, leading indicators are going through the roof. Consumer confidence is high. Um, my number one indicator is the spread between short and long-term treasuries, and it went out anywhere near a recession at this point. Uh, job openings, there are more than six million unfilled job openings in this country. That's a record. Um, and uh, hourly wages have moved up to more than inflation, but there's certainly not a, a lot of uh, uh, inflationary pressures at this point. And labor force participation rate really is extremely low. Hopefully some of those people will come back. There are some headwinds. Um, I'll let you look at this for a second. But that's um, uh, uh, auto sales are, uh, I don't know where they can go from here, and the trade gap, despite what you hear, is actually widening. So th those are some issues. But it's really in policy that um, things are uh, getting kind of dicey. So let's talk briefly about the tax plan. Yeah, there's a corporate tax cut, and that's severely needed. I think even Democrats understand that. There's a reduction in tax brackets. Basically, uh, you're going to have a huge percentage of the population just filing their, uh, uh, their tax return on a, on a three by five card. Uh, there's a doubling the standard deduction. There's health care. Uh, there's going to be no deduction for state and local taxes, which is a big deal for uh, a lot of people. Uh, but I'm, I'm just going to talk to you in generalities about the winners and losers. Uh, based on this plan, uh, the winners are going to be people who don't take, uh, that should be uh, itemized deductions, uh, heirs of very large estates, high, uh, higher earning owners of uh, uh, limited liability corporations and S-corps, and those who pay the uh, alternative minimum tax, which uh, is far beyond its, its uh, original intent. The losers are going to be uh, people of high tax states. Um, they, they, they got issues. People who take charitable mortgage deductions, a lot of those are uh, incentives are going to go away. High wage earners are going to be uh, negatively affected. People with large medical um, or disaster deductions and students who itemize their loan interest. Those, those people are going to be hurt. Um, but uh, I just want to talk more than anything about the generalities of, of what you can expect. In the short term, I don't see how you don't get faster growth even this late in the cycle between personal tax cuts, corporate tax cuts, reduced regulation, and that I want to, as we'll talk about in a minute, it's not reduced regulation, it's reduced rate of growth of regulation, and there's a huge difference, I think. And uh, infrastructure spending. And the long-term effects depend on the type of tax cuts, especially the corporate tax cuts. But what you can expect is higher interest rates and higher cap rates, higher inflation, higher after-tax profits, larger deficits are a given as far as I'm concerned, and the labor situation is going to get worse, not better. Um, and and uh, we'll talk briefly about immigration. But what else? Uh, so if, if done correctly, it's going to make a significant difference. If not, well, uh, they're going to be less significant. All right, so what keeps me up at night? Because now, last year, nothing kept me up at night. Now, lots of things keep me up at night. I, just too much caffeine. Um, first, the lack of political capital. Uh, 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 it doesn't seem obvious. I don't have to talk to you about this because all you have to do is pick up the paper or uh, turn on CNN and then uh, Fox and you think you're in different countries. Um, the lack of consistency on immigration. <coughs> yeah, immigration should be merit-based. I don't care if your cousin's been here for three generations. It should be merit-based. But there's nothing behind that. We need workers in a lot of industries, including high tech, including construction. Nothing's being done. That's a real problem. Uh, how close to full employment uh, um, um, are we? This was tried four times in the, in the 20th century, early in the cycle, and it worked like a charm. This late in the cycle, it's going to be a little, little more dicey, in my opinion. How many people are left to get come back in the labor force? I don't know. And uh, where are the construction and high-tech workers going to come from? I don't know. Um, the recovery in this hundredth expan month of expansion, uh, how long can it last? I don't know, um, but I think it'll be a, a lot longer. Other things that bother me, um, demographics. There are two reasons we've had slower growth. One, you know, the, 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 the economists have this thing, potential 
uh, uh, real potential GDP. And it's really how many workers, how many hours can, can people work, how many workers are being added to the labor force, and productivity growth. Well, if you take a look at the column on, on your left, the annual growth in the labor force has really slowed down. And according to the, uh, the government, it's going to continue to be slow. That affects how fast we can grow. And take a look at the participation rate. That, look, it's way down. And you don't know whether that's coming back. The government doesn't think it will. I personally think it will, but we'll see what happens. And then you get the productivity growth. You want to see where, where the rubber hits the road with regulation? It's on productivity growth. And it really isn't there. It should be there, given how bad, bad the, uh, the last recession was, but it's not. And that, to me, is the one thing that perhaps, it's just a bunch of question marks that I don't have a clue. Um, and and it perhaps uh, tax cuts and lower rates of growth and regulation will affect that. Um, uh, in that regard, uh, Trump has been able to reduce regulation. You don't have to look at the bottom numbers. You just have to look at the red on the bottom. Even Trump, with all of bravado, has only been able to slow the rate of growth in regulation. He hasn't stopped it or reversed it. And, and to give you some of the idea of the regulations were, that, that go into Congress, uh, here's, here's a, an important regulation. Uh, <laughs> asked, um, there's one, there are some that are counterproductive. That are like this, <laughs> and, and there's one that are common sense. Uh, the other thing that bothers me is that this cycle is no spring chicken, okay? Uh, uh, essentially, we're at 100 months, the longest recovery in U.S. history, not just post-war history, because prior to World War II, there were recessions very frequently uh, that didn't last very long, uh, except for 1929. But uh, essentially, um, this is within two years of being the longest recovery in U.S. history, the longest one's 120 months, and, and we're probably going to get there. Um, so, uh, and, and by the way, as everybody said, this is also the slowest expansion in U.S. history, not by a little, but by a lot. And I personally think it's regulatory more than anything, but that's, we'll see. Uh, can the expansion last? Yeah, it can. Uh, expansions don't die of old age, they die become the, because they become uh, vulnerable to exogenous shocks or asset bubbles or, or tightening in, in credit markets. None of those things appear to be on the horizon to me with the potential of one we'll talk about. It's like when you get older, you become more vulnerable to disease. That's what happens to recoveries. Uh, so where do we stand in this cycle? Well, let's talk about consumers, all right? Um, uh, financial obligation tracing. This is how much of, of uh, people's income goes for previously accumulated debt. Uh, the, it, it's back to where it was in the 80s. A lot of that was involuntary, but it occurred. Consumers are in good shape. The use of credit cards is under control. The bottom line is credit cards, uh, credit card debt. It's just getting back to where it was at the previous peak. And the upper line is two things. It's auto debt and student loan debt. Um, we'll talk about student loan debt. But in terms of auto loans, interestingly enough, the FICO scores of those people buying autos is actually higher than it had been in previous cycles. That's, that's encouraging. Consumer liquidity, um, uh, this is another regulation. Uh, uh, household financial assets because of the stock market are way up. No irrational exuberance. This, maybe, maybe not, I haven't quite figured this one out. This is Robert Shaw's cyclically adjusted PE ratio. And there have only been two times in, in uh, US history it's been higher. This is go, goes back to 1900, and those blue lines are recessions. You can see how often recessions occurred prior to World War II. Um, uh, this is very high by historic standards. Um, I don't know how much higher it's going to go, but it probably will be. Uh, maybe it's because of the tax cuts, because after-tax earnings are going to go up. Maybe it's because the, the, the really horrible earnings of 2009 are still in here. I don't know. but. This, this is something to watch. Uh, real incomes up, inflation, Dennis covered is low. Fed policy has to stay expansive. They have to put bullets in their gun, and their bullets are higher interest rates. I don't see where the Fed has anywhere to go. Uh, conclusions, uh, it, where the prob probabilities of recession are extremely low. How about Arizona? Well, welcome to Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> The, the, there are two things that make this recovery different in Arizona than all other recoveries. One we'll talk about is rate of growth in population, but the second is where the growth in employment's been. 
almost 88% of all the jobs created in, greater, in the state have been in Greater Phoenix. Um, that compares to about 78% for a, a normal cycle. So it is much more concentrated, and uh, I, I'm not even going to go into why, um, but the, the bottom line is that it's much more concentrated. Uh, the second, in terms of rank, we, if you took this all the way back to the 50s, we'd be first, second, or third every year except during recessions. Something changed after 2007. We're now 12th so far this year. Not bad, top 20%, uh, but not where we are have been historically. <laughs> Um, in terms of Greater Phoenix, Phoenix was always the first, second, and third uh, most rapidly growing major market in the country. A major employment market has more than a million jobs, and now we're about 10th. Not bad out of the 34 markets, but not anywhere near we were historically. So uh, what's going on? We also broke this down in terms of employment for each county, and we took 85 to 2009, and of 2008 and then 2010 forward. And you can see that every county in the state essentially is growing less rapidly. Uh, yeah, Greenlee County is, is uh, higher, but they opened another 7-Eleven in Greenlee County. <laughs> 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 um, but Maricopa and, and Pinell County, Greater Phoenix, have done relatively well compared to everybody else, but not compared to history. Same thing is true with population, and population uh, explains a lot of it. Um, and again, when we examine, we, we talked about this last year, we've done a little more research about why are things so far? Well, it's basically the horribly slow recovery nationally, but it's the slowdown in population growth nationally, and Arizona's share of that, that really is the culprit here. Uh, obviously, if you have a state growing at 1.3% instead of 3.2%, that's a lot fewer people. When people move to town, they bring their own demand for goods and services that creates demand for more jobs, that creates demand for more goods and services. So when you have less population growth, you're going to have slower employment growth. That's by definition. Um, and as you can see, uh, where the annual percentage growth in the, uh, in the, is much slower this time around than it was any other cycle. Uh, and, you know, this is just population growth, uh, rather, it is much lower, and you can see what it was historically. All right, let's take a look at this, though, and this is employment growth. Again, the employment growth has been abysmal in this cycle um, uh, relative to history, um, but that's true nationally. So we, we went, uh, let me skip a couple, fewer people means fewer jobs, and take a look at why. Uh, by the way, uh, this is employment much lower than historic norms. Uh, so where, where are the people, okay? Uh, by the way, this is from the Office of Economic Opportunity. They suggest that employment growth, or excuse me, population growth in the state is permanently lower. We'll see about that. It means to be seen. What we did is we took a look at the percentage of people moved. Now, if you moved across the street, I don't really care because you didn't create a new demand. All I care about is people who move from abroad, people who move from other states, or people who move from other counties, and, and uh, uh, because they, they probably are creating new demand. And as you can see, the percentage of the population that's moving really started to hit the skids after 2005 and has not recovered at all. Uh, and we'll talk about why in a minute. And Arizona's capture rate, at one point in 2005 and 2006, we captured one out of every 10 people who moved in this country. Amazing, just amazing. Um, we got down to under two, and we're back to maybe about four and a half, just under five. That's really pretty good for a state that accounts for 2% of the state's, or the country's population. So, uh, uh, for a state that accounts for 2% of the country's population. So it's improving. But, we went back and we took these numbers and ran them through our, our uh, input-output models. And had you had the same type of population growth that you had from 2001 to 2005, our employment growth would have been 3.7% in 14, 4.1 in 15, and 3.8 in 16. Nobody would be up here saying this has been a crappy recovery. Okay? So it's really the population that has affected us. There's about 30% of the difference that, between that and what's normal I can't account for, but 70% of its population group. By the way, this is APS's uh, 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 net residential utility hookups. It gives you some idea about how weak it is in terms of population relative to history. All right, so how quickly is it going to recover? Slowly. All right, let me talk a little about housing, um, because my time's almost up. 
This used to, there used to be a parade of horribles I would talk to you about. Now it's become a parade of positives. First, here are the, the, the things that are used to be horrible and now are good. Negative equity, foreclosures, millennials, student loans, tougher loan standards. And then I added a new one, the effect of the property, uh, uh, the mortgage interest deduction, and but more state tax limitations. Those deductions are going to hurt. All right. In 2011, 69% of people had uh, less than an 80% loan to value ratio. Those are people who can move. Now, it's, in 2016, it's 88%. Well, that's 14 and a half million households that are now free to move. They've got enough equity to sell a ha house in Minnesota, take some money out, and move somewhere else and buy a house. Um, so that's, that's good news. Second thing is mortgage foreclosures. The blue line is actual foreclosures. The red line is the, uh, what I call a penalty box, the seven-year lockout from Freddie and Fannie if you uh, basically uh, had a foreclosure. That's almost all over. All those people are back in the market. Millennials. Here's where we run into some problems. Um, and, and by the way, there are, there are, you got to read fast. <laughs> There's more millennials than there are baby boomers. It's the largest generation ever. And they have managed, I, I won't go into detail, some of it's caused by circumstances beyond their control. Some of it's caused by their wussy parents who overprovided for them. Uh, <laughs> um, but the bottom line is they have delayed uh, adulthood well into their 30s, which is amazing. <laughs> but here's what happens over time. This, the, 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 the second column, first column is age, second column is a percentage of people in that age group that own houses. As, and the third column is the percentage of the pop, current population, and then 10 years from now, how many people will be in that age group. As millennials get older, they will buy houses. Uh, and that is, the, means there's tremendous pent-up demand for housing, in my opinion. Uh, and, and I think this is a, a fact you're not going to get away from, that the outlook for housing really is quite positive as millennials, not all of them, but many of them, finally follow their ha parents into housing. Um, the median age of a buyer, by the way, this gives you some idea of what's gone on, since 2009 has jumped. It's 44 years old. It used to be under, under 40. So millennials essentially have caused that. Um, now, take a look at millennials versus baby boomers. I guess the most important ones are, uh, in, in, when baby boomers were in the same situation in 1980, only 20% of them had never been married. It's 53% for millennials. Of though, how about, how about living with your parents? Nine versus 22. Uh, home ownership, 60 versus 43. There's a lot of pent up demand there for housing. And when you delay getting married, you delay having children. When you delay having children, you delay, delay, delay the need for a house and all that crap you buy at Home Depot and never use. Uh, but uh, so this, this is a problem. Now, this gets back to, to why we've had less population growth. This is the, we, we indexed movement to, uh, to 2005. And what you see here is that people 20 to 24 are moving a lot less. People 25 to 29 are moving a lot less. People 30 to 34 are moving a lot less. People 35 to 39 are moving less. Well, guess what demographic group this is? Millennials, what a coincidence. OK, <laughs> let's take a look at everybody else. Well, people 40 to 59 are moving as much or more than they did in 2005. People who are 60 to 75 plus are moving more than they did at that, so it's all millennials not getting in the system, not moving. It's having a huge impact. Hopefully that will change. By the way, people 75 and plus, they're taking you to the home. It doesn't matter. Uh, okay. This is the one negative that, uh, in, in the Trump tax plan. Um, because of the doubling the standard deduction, only filers above $200,000 really are going to have incentive to continue itemizing. So there's a lot of people who say, well, I'm going to buy a house and get a tax deduction. For a lot of people, that's gone. Okay? Second thing, uh, and, and if, if you're buying a $410,000 home, what's the property tax going to be here? Uh, 
you know, whatever it is. Uh, in, in California, by the way, you can't get a starter home for $410,000. In, in Connecticut, in New York, in, in, in New Jersey, those people are screwed. And that's simple. Okay. Yep, you got it. And, and so uh, I have a house in California. I appreciate the things. So the, the bottom line is that that is a huge impact on those particular, that particular demographic. All right, let's continue. Student loan debt. Um, it's quadrupled, and we, we just ran some numbers. We said, okay, uh, if you have an original loan, and most student loan debt is under $25,000 when people get out. So this is, we'll see, we're talking about a, a, just a segment of the population. But if you come out with $150,000 in debt, you could afford a $333,000 house. You could live in a lot of places, maybe not Flagstaff, but a lot of places. Um, and if, if you are get a ten or twenty five thousand dollars, it's going to affect your ability to save for a home, but it's really not going to affect you long term. Uh, debt over fifty thousand dollars has tripled. It's from five percent of the people who come out of school to sixteen. Between twenty and forty nine nine, it's gone from fifteen to twenty four. So it's going to have an impact, and it's delaying. Uh, especially that 16%, those people could be out of the market for quite some time. Others are going to just have a tougher time saving for a down payment. In fact, the, uh, the National Association of Realtors says, okay, uh, of those who say, 23% uh, saying they're having tough time saving for a down payment, um, that's the most difficult task. And the number one reason for 35 years and, old and younger is student loans. So it's having an impact. Now, in the long run, if they get an education and a marketable skill, you're in great shape. If your kid comes out as a Russian literature major, he's going to be in your basement for quite some time. <laughs> okay, here's a guy who just paid off his student loan. <laughs> All right, let's talk about credit availability. There are actually some people who are saying the housing market is a bubble. These people have been living in a cave. Um, this is what uh, you know, mortgage credit availability looks like since 2012. This is what it looks like if you go back to 2005. It's nothing compared to the way it was, nothing at all. Secondly, take a look at the FICO scores of those people who are originating. A, a, it's way up. FICO scores are much higher. It's a much higher quality person. Here's what FICO scores look like in 2006. And it starts, the, the, the axis is at 500, and it goes to uh, uh, 850. Here's what it looks like today. It's a completely different buyer, a much higher quality buyer. The housing market is not in trouble at all. Uh, so I think the housing recovery is likely to continue, uh, despite the negative impact on, uh, uh, of the, the inability to, ta to uh, state and local taxes. All right, a couple of other quick things. Um, and this, this is Greater Phoenix, but I think you're in, uh, in terms of housing permits for a 10% increase. Multifamily housing, demographics have never been better in the history of mankind. I think it is virtually impossible to overbuild multifamily housing at this point, at least for the next 10 years. This is births leg 26 years. It's as, as high as the boom in the 80s. Uh, 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 but because millennials are delaying marriage, they will be in apartments five to six years longer than baby boomers were. On top of that, you got baby boomers, some of whom have a lot of equity, who could sell their home and live in a nice apartment. So I think the demographics for apartments are great. Uh, rents are going up. They went up 7% last year in Phoenix. Uh, they're going up 5% now. So they're going up two and a half times the rate of inflation. There's a supply-demand imbalance. That's, uh, I'm, I'm going to skip to retail because that's the only other sector that has issues. Okay. Vacancy rates are still high. And, and, and there's one overriding reason. How many of you get boxes delivered every day? My house is like a warehouse. Every day my wife gets three boxes. Somehow the next day she sends back four. I don't quite understand. Uh, but uh, e-commerce is just wiping out retail sales. And um, Nordstrom's, by the way, has a prototype store in San Francisco at 3,000 feet. It has computers some concierges, and you can try on size and see colors, and they'll order it for you. And that's, that's where retail's going. It's a completely different model. You're not going to have these massive stores anymore. Uh, this is the other one that I find scary. This is the percent of total sales by retailer type. This goes back to 1992, okay? Well, that red line, which is about 60%, and is now down to, what's that, 
way under 40, that is grocery stores, all right? And guess what just happened? Amazon bought Whole Foods. I wonder where they're going. Um, uh, the blue line, uh, which is department stores, went from 30% to under 10% of retail sales. Uh, even the, the warehouse concepts, the price clubs and, you know, uh, uh, super uh, Kmarts or whatever, that's starting to go down. The only line that's going up is, surprise, surprise, the internet. And so that, that's going to make uh, retailing difficult. All right, so what's my overall conclusion? This is from one of Ron's classes, by the way. <laughs> and uh, the expansion is going to continue. I just don't see how it doesn't. I think it will accelerate next year. You, with that much stimulus, we're in good shape. Uh, how rapid will be up in the air? It depends on these guys, which is always scary. Um, and with that, stay tuned. Thanks a lot. <laughs>